Hey there, this video is a response to uh, Pastor Patrick Hines. Uh, recently came across a YouTube video of his uh, answering some questions about baptism and covenant theology and thought it would be a good opportunity to respond and, and clarify some issues. Um, wasn't, wasn't really familiar with uh, Patrick before. Um, I'm familiar with the Thorn Crown Network and I saw that he's uh, a part of that. Um, uh, Tim and Carlos for Semper Reformanda Radio have actually invited me to to um, come on and speak about covenant theology sometime in the near future. Um, so I am familiar with the ministry, and you know maybe it'll be an opportunity for um, Patrick and I, maybe you and I can sit down and, and talk about this on uh, one of the podcasts or something. I think that'd be great. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd love to just respond to some of the things you said and and hopefully we can continue a, a dialogue here on this. Uh, before I get started, just uh, I want to say a quick prayer. Uh, Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to discuss your word together, Father, to sharpen one another, to grow in our understanding of your word. We ask that you would keep that central in our minds, that you would put to death any pride within us that uh, would turn this into <clears throat> a game or a sparring match or a way to win an argument. Uh, rather than a means of growing an understanding of your word. Uh, Father, I ask that you would keep that central and that you would humble myself and, and anyone else here who is listening or are interested in discussing these things. Father, we ask for your grace and your Holy Spirit upon this. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so I just want to say thank you again for bringing these issues up and, and discussing them. Um, I watched your video, Patrick, and I also listened to the two sermons you linked to uh, as well. And um, in the sermons you mentioned that you recognize there is a wide variety, are a wide variety of different Baptist views. Um, I appreciate your recognition there. You know, John MacArthur is not going to have the same view as somebody who holds the London Baptist Confession, Second London Baptist Confession, for example. So I appreciate that you recognize that there are uh, a variety of different views there. Um, and that's true amongst Reformed Pado Baptists as well, as we'll see here in, in this video. There are uh, a wide variety of views, even within Reformed Pado Baptists as well. Uh, the view that I'm putting forward here is something known as 1689 federalism. Um, at, that's not just a label referring to anybody who holds to the Second London Baptist Confession. Um, it refers to a specific understanding of covenant theology. Uh, that was held to by the majority of, of the people who signed, the pastors who signed the Second London Baptist Confession. That's where it gets its name. Um, but I mention that because in your sermon you listed uh, the names of people that you um, consulted when trying to understand the Baptist view. You mentioned Greg Welty, James White, Fred Malone, John Piper, John MacArthur, uh, Brian Borgman, and maybe a few others. Um, those men don't hold to what's known as 1689 federalism. Um, they hold to a slightly different view. So their exegesis, their view is not necessarily going to be uh, the same as, as what, uh, what I would hold to um, for the most part. Um, have a lot of agreement and overlap with, with them, um, but on a few points, uh, I'm not necessarily gonna agree with them, uh, especially in some of the areas that you, that you mentioned. Um, I know it can be kind of annoying to say, oh, well, great, now you've studied all of those, now you really have to study mine, uh, another view. Um, I agree it is frustrating, it is annoying, but you know, there's no, really no way around it. Um, I've had to go through the same thing with understanding Reform Pado Baptist. There are many different views there um, that go in different directions, that they disagree with one another, and I've had to patiently sort through all of those different views and try to understand them as best I can and treat them all in their own terms. Um, so just hope you can extend that to us as well and, and hear this out. Um, the, uh, the main argument or the main thrust of your video was that um, the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant are one and the same covenant and they are made only with the elect. That um, the unregenerate, reprobate children of believers are not part of the Abrahamic or New Covenants. Everyone in the New Covenant is regenerate, just like everyone in the Abrahamic Covenant is regenerate. Are, are the children of believers members of the New Covenant? No, they are not. P people have said to me, well, what, what covenant are your children in? To me, that's the same as asking, well, well what covenant was Esau in? 
what covenant was Ishmael in? Uh, Esau, um, God did not establish his covenant with Esau. God did not establish his covenant with um, Ishmael. Both were circumcised, though, and both were raised as part of the covenant community because they were part of Abraham's household. But neither of them, although they bore the sign, neither of them were in the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, and that was um, odd to hear. I don't think I have heard it stated that way by any Pado Baptist that I have read. I have not come across any of them say that unbelieving, unregenerate children of believers are not in the New Covenant or, or are not in the Abrahamic Covenant either. Uh, I, you know, If you've got somebody you can point me to that you've read that says that, I'd be happy to read it. Um, I imagine that uh, some of where you're coming from is from Westminster Larger Catechism, question 31. It says, with whom was the covenant of grace made? The answer, the covenant of grace was made with Christ as the second Adam, and in him with all the elect as his seed. So I can understand where you're coming from there, but that has to be read um, in light of or together with um, uh, Westminster Larger Catechism, question 166, which says, Under whom is baptism to be administered? Answer, baptism is not to be administered to any that are out of the visible church, and so strangers from the covenant of promise, till they profess their faith in Christ and obedience to him. But infants descending from parents, either both or but one of them, professing faith in Christ and obedience to him, are in that respect within the covenant and to be baptized. Uh, so it's not the, the, the Westminster Conf uh, Catechism of Standards teach that um, in one sense, the covenant of grace was, was made only with the elect, but in another sense, all the children of professing believers are within the covenant. Uh, the Westminster divines believed that unregenerate, reprobate children of professing believers were in the covenant of grace. Uh, here's a quote from Samuel Rutherford commenting on Acts 2.39. Um, the promise is to you and to your children. Break the text into a hundred pieces and bl uh, blood it as men please. The genuine thesis, which cannot be neglected, is these to whom the promise of the covenant does belong, these should be baptized. But the promise of the covenant is to you and to your children. Ergo, you and your children should be baptized. The assumption is the express words of Peter and the proposition is Peter's. Every one of you be baptized, for to you is the promise of the covenant. Calvin, Bollinger, Brennius, Galther, clear it. Uh, who are they who are in the nearest capacity to be baptized, he explains, when he shows that the covenant promise is made to these who are far off, to the Gentiles whom the Lord shall call, then all that are under the call and offer of Christ in the preached gospel, um, as Proverbs 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, Matthew 22, bid them come to the wedding, Luke 14, 16, 17, 18, are externally in covenant, and such to whom the covenant is made and should be baptized. So just let me reread that real quick. Rutherford is saying that all that are under the call and offer of Christ in the preached gospel are invited to come to the wedding, are externally in covenant, and such to whom the covenant is made and should be baptized. They are covenant members, therefore they should be baptized. It is not limited to the elect alone. Rutherford continues, Calvin shows Acts 2.39 that the Anabaptists in his time said the promise was made to believers only, but the text says it is made to you and to your children, to infants, to the children of prophets, and of the covenant made with the, with the fathers, Acts 3.25 then it cannot be denied, but the promise is to all the reprobate in the visible church, whether they believe or not. Hence, the covenant must be considered in two ways. In abstracto and, form, um, in abstracto and formally, in the letter, as a simple way of saving sinners. So they believe, so all within the visible church are in the covenant of grace, and so it contains only the will of precept. And then two, in the um, in the concrete, as the Lord carries on the covenant in such a way as commensurably with the decrees of election and reprobation, as the Lord not only promises but acts and engraves the law in the heart, commensurately with his decree of election, so the elect are under the covenant of grace. Hey, uh, just one more quick one I'm going to throw in from Rutherford. Infants born of covenanted parents are in covenant with God because they are born of such parents as are in covenant with God. Genesis 17, 7. I will be a God 
to thy seat after thee. Uh, again, the link to all these from Rutherford is in the uh, links below under the video. So Rutherford's point here is that there were two ways to be in the covenant of grace, externally and internally. That's the standard Westminster position. That's the standard Reformed Pado-Baptist position. There are two ways of being in the covenant of grace. I haven't come across any who have said there is only, uh, only the elect are part of the covenant of grace. They all acknowledge that there is some sense in which um, the unregenerate, reprobate are also in the covenant of grace, that they are members in the covenant of grace. Uh, Calvin says baptism is that by which we attest that infants are contained within God's covenant. You could not be born into the Abrahamic covenant. You could not be born into that covenant. Now, could you be born into the visible administration of the covenant of grace in that time? Yes. But could you be an actual member of that covenant by birth? The answer is clearly no. The infant of a believer, by hereditary right according to the form of the promise, is already included within the covenant from his mother's womb. Or, to put the matter more clearly and briefly, if the children of believers are partakers in the covenant, without the help of understanding, there is no reason why they should be barred from the sign merely because they cannot swear to the provisions of the covenant. So again, Calvin, and this is this is the common repeated um, argument for pedo baptism is that because the infants of professing believers are in the covenant by birth, therefore they have a right to baptism. Um, that was from Institutes Book 4, um, Chapter 16, Paragraph 24, and so is the following. You could not be born into the Abrahamic covenant. Those infants who derive their origin from Christians as they have been born directly into the inheritance of the covenant and are expected by God, are thus to be received into baptism. Again, baptized because they are covenant members. Uh, and then again, uh, from paragraph 6, both the children of the Jews, be because, they, uh, because when made heirs of that covenant, they were separated from the heathen, were called a holy seed, and for the same reason the children of Christians, or those who have only one believing parent, are called holy, and by the testimony of the apostle, differ from the impure seed of idolaters. Um, again, the point is just to, just to explain that the position that you put forward in the in your video in response to Baptist arguments is not the standard Pado Baptist view. It, it, as far as I can tell, it appears to be idiosyncratic. It, it appears to be your own view. Again, if you can point me to somebody who has made the argument that you have, I would be happy to read it. Uh, but everything that I have come across uh, teaches that there are um, uh, two ways of being in the covenant of grace, and that infants are to be baptized because they are members of the covenant of grace. Um, continuing with this here, you said that uh, the Abrahamic covenant was not made with the nation of Israel. That covenant was made with the elect alone. The Abrahamic covenant was made with the elect, not the nation of Israel. Again, I just want to point out some uh, quotes here from Reformed Pado Baptists arguing the exact opposite. Here's Thomas Blake, uh, 17th century. Uh, that seed of Abraham that had possession of the land of Canaan through the gift and by virtue of the promise of God is the seed here taken into covenant to have the Lord for their God. This is so plain that nothing can be plainer um, to any that read the words. But the natural seed of Abraham, all the seed of Jacob in their several tribes, according as God set them their bounds, inherited the land of Canaan, which is called the land of their inheritance, and not only the spirit and not only the spiritual seed regenerate. God Himself speaks to the whole body of Israel when they were newly come up out of the land of Egypt. He says, I am the Lord your God. Exodus 2:20, Deuteronomy 5:6. God owned all of the whole, that whole people as his, all of them being Abraham's natural issue, yet all of them were not spiritual. Uh, Calvin commenting on uh, Romans 11 on the olive tree says, Let us remember that in this comparison man is not compared with man, but nation with nation. If then a comparison be made between them, they shall be found equal in this respect, that they are both equally the children of Adam. The only difference is that the Jews had been separated from the Gentiles, that they might be a peculiar people to the Lord. They were then sanctified by the Holy Covenant and adorned with peculiar honor, with which God had not at all 
uh, not at that time favored the Gentiles, but as the efficacy of the covenant appeared then but small, he bids us to look back to Abraham and the patriarchs, in whom the blessing of God was not indeed either empty or void. He hence concludes that from them a uh, hereditary holiness had passed to all their posterity. But this conclusion would not have been right had he spoken of persons, or rather had he not regarded the promise. For when the Father is just, he cannot yet transmit his own righteousness own uprightness to his son, that as the Lord had sanctified Abraham for himself, for this end, that his seed might also be holy, and as he thus conferred holiness not only on his person, but also on his whole race, the apostle does not unsuitably draw this conclusion, that all the Jews were sanctified in their father Abraham. It is not then a strange thing that the Jews were sanctified in their father. There is here no difficulty, if you understand by holiness the spiritual nobility of the nation, and that indeed not belonging to nature, but that, uh, but what proceeded from the covenant. So Calvin's again just saying the same thing um, in, with regards to an internal versus external covenant of grace. He's saying this has not regard to internal uprightness, um, but it has regard to external or federal holiness, that all of um, Abraham's offspring, limited down through the line of Jacob, uh, were within uh, the covenant and were therefore considered holy. Uh, the editor of Calvin's commentary includes this footnote. That the holiness here mentioned is external and relative and not personal and inward is evident from the whole context. The children of Israel were uh, denominated holy in all their wickedness and disobedience because they had been consecrated to God, adopted as his people, and set apart for his service. And they enjoyed all the external privileges of the covenant which God had made with their fathers. The holiness, says Turretin, of the first fruits and of the root was no other than an external, federal, and national consecration, such as could be transferred from parents to their children. And again, real quick, Rutherford here on the olive tree as well. If the root be holy, so also are the branches. Now, this holiness cannot be meant of personal and inherent holiness, for it is not true in that sense. If the fathers and forefathers be truly sanctified and are believers, then are the branches and children sanctified and believers. But the contrary we see in wicked Absalom, born of holy David and many others. Therefore, this holiness must be the holiness of the nation, not of uh, persons. It must be a holiness because of their elected and chosen parents, the patriarchs, prophets, and the holy seed of the Jews. And so the holiness federal or the holiness of the covenant. Now here's a, a quote from uh, Burkhoff's Systematic Theology on the section of the Covenant of Grace um, titled uh, Membership in the Covenant. And he's He's very candid in talking about this issue and how it's perplexed um, Reformed Pato Baptists down through the centuries. Um, he says, What induced these theologians to speak of the covenant as made with the elect, in spite of all the practical difficulties involved? The idea that the covenant is fully realized only in the elect is a perfectly scriptural idea, as appears, for instance, from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. But now the question arises whether in the estimation of these Reformed theologians, all the non-elect are outside of the covenant of grace in every sense of the word. Brockle virtually takes this position, but he is not in line with the majority. They realize very well that a covenant of grace, which in no sense of the word includes others than the elect, would be purely individual, while the covenant of grace is represented in scripture as an organic idea. They were fully aware of the fact that, according to God's special revelation, both the Old and New Testament, the covenant as a historical phenomenon is perpetuated in successive generations and includes many in whom the covenant life is never realized. And whenever they desired to include this aspect of the covenant in their definition, they would say that it was established with believers and their seed. So, again, Burkhoff says that it's not just with the elect. It's also with unregenerate reprobate. Uh, you said that Esau and Ishmael were not covenant members because God did not establish his covenant with them. And then you concluded from there that the unregenerate reprobate were not members of the covenant of grace because God does not establish his covenant with them. But here Burkhoff says um, the majority view is that God does establish the covenant of grace with believers and their seed, including unregenerate reprobate seed. Now, the majority could be wrong. In fact, I do think that they're wrong. So that's not my point here. I'm not trying to argue by authority. I'm just pointing out that your view seems very idiosyncratic, and I'd love to hear you expand on it more uh, or offer a fuller definition because 
Uh, it's not something I've come across before, and it is not the standard Pato Baptist argument. Um, with regards to Esau and Ishmael, when God says that he does not establish his covenant with them, he's not saying necessarily that they are reprobate. Uh, he's saying that the Abrahamic covenant is not established with them, meaning that um, the Messiah who is to be born from Abraham was not to be born from Ishmael and was not to be born from Esau, but was to be born through Isaac and Jacob instead. And likewise, the offspring to whom he promised to give the land of Canaan was not going to be through Ishmael, and it was not going to be through Esau, but rather through Isaac and through Jacob. That's what the text in Genesis uh, refers to at that point. Um, so with regards to the question of were there any unregenerate children of Abraham uh, who were members of the Abrahamic or Mosaic, or the Abrahamic, we'll stick with that, the Abrahamic covenant. Um, Romans 9, 3 through 4 says, for I, uh, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. It's, it's pretty clear right there. Paul says his kinsmen, according to the flesh, the covenant belongs to them. Not just to the elect, it belongs to Israelites according to the flesh. Um, Genesis 17, 7 says, I will establish my covenant between me and, to, and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your uh, descendants after you. Now, the important point here is that you would argue that this is a promise of eternal salvation made to the elect alone. But that's not how scripture interprets that promise. Um, that promise was made to Israel according to the flesh, Abraham's natural offspring, and it was fulfilled when God brought them out of Egypt into the land of Canaan where they dwelt um, with God as their king, when he established a unique form of worship with them, and he was their God in a way that he was not God of other nations. Exodus 2.24 says, And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Exodus 6, verse 2 says, God spoke to Moses and said to him, <clears throat> I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. See, I established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan. That's what... God, uh, God was referring to when he said, I will not establish my covenant with Ishmael and Esau. He says, I did establish my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they live as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore <clears throat> to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for possession. I am the Lord. Uh, and then Deuteronomy 29.9 says, Keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. You are standing today, all of you, before the Lord your God, the heads of your tribes, your elders, and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and your sojourner who is in your camp, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, so that you may enter into the sworn covenant of the Lord your God, which the Lord your God is making with you today, that he may establish you today as his people, and that he may be your God as he promised you and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. It is not with you alone that I am making this sworn covenant, but with whoever is standing here with us today before the Lord our God and with whomever, whoever is not here with us today. So again, these passages are teaching that God's establishment of the Mosaic covenant with the whole nation of Israel was a fulfillment of Genesis 17, 7, his promise to be a God to Abraham's offspring. Um, and in Jeremiah 11, verses 2 through 5, says, Hear the words of this covenant, and speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Cursed be the man who does not hear the words of this covenant, 
that I commanded your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Listen to my voice and do all that I command you. So shall you be my people, and I will be your God, that I may confirm the oath that I swore to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. Um, again, here this is teaching that the Mosaic Covenant was a fulfillment of Genesis 17, the Abrahamic Covenant promise to give the land of Canaan to Abraham's natural offspring. And it here says, you, you argue that there's a difference between the Abrahamic Covenant of Promise and the Mosaic Covenant of Law, the legal covenant. Uh, but here the text says that um, obedience to the legal covenant was the means of fulfilling the promise made to Abraham. Uh, so this brings us to the question of how the Abrahamic covenant relates to the Old Covenant. Um, so your argument again was that they are not the same covenant. You said that they are distinct. They are two different covenants. They are not the same covenant. And the Abrahamic promise is not the Old Covenant. And so when Hebrews chapter 8 cites Jeremiah 31, and well, the New Covenant is, is different from the Old Covenant. Yeah, it's different from the legal covenant at Sinai where the people three times swear an oath of obedience. That covenant was not a promise covenant like the Abrahamic promise was. So the Abrahamic covenant is not the Old Covenant. Again, that is not the historic Reformed Pado baptist position. Reformed Westminster Pado baptist position is that the Abrahamic Covenant, Mosaic Covenant, Davidic Covenant, and New Covenant are all the same covenant. They are all the covenant of grace. Calvin says, It is absolutely certain that the original promises comprehending the covenant which God made with the Israelites under the old dispensation were spiritual and had reference to eternal life, and were, of course, in like manner, spiritually received by the fathers, that they might thence entertain a sure hope of immortality and aspire to it with their whole soul. Um, that's Institutes, Book 4, Chapter 16, Paragraph 11. And then in his commentary on Jeremiah 31, he says, Now, as to the new covenant, it is not so called because it is contrary to the first covenant, the old covenant. For God is never inconsistent with himself, nor is he unlike himself. He then, who once made a covenant with his chosen people, had not changed his purpose, as though he had forgotten his faithfulness. It follows then that the first covenant, the old covenant, was inviolable. Besides, he had already made his covenant with Abraham, and the law, the old covenant, was a confirmation of that covenant. As then, the, as then the law depended on that covenant, which God made with his servant Abraham, it follows that God could never have made a new, that is a contrary or a different covenant. God has never made any other covenant than that which he made formerly with Abraham, and at length confirmed by the hand of Moses. This subject might be more fully handled, but it is enough briefly to show that the covenant which God made at first is perpetual. So that's the majority traditional Reformed Pado baptist position is that it's all one covenant. The error that they make constantly is they, they really do treat the Abrahamic covenant as if it is the old covenant. It's not. The Abrahamic covenant is not the old covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is completely distinct from uh, the Old Covenant, completely different from the Old Covenant. God has never made any other covenant than that which he made formerly with Abraham and at length confirmed by the hand of Moses. Again, one more quick quote from Rutherford I want to throw in here. So God shows clearly that in Abraham he chose the nation and the house, Genesis eighteen nineteen. I know Abraham that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord. Afterward, he chose the nation to be a peculiar people holy to himself, Deuteronomy 6, uh, 7, 6, and 7, but not with another new distinct covenant, but in the same covenant. Uh, but because the Lord loved you and would keep the oath that he had sworn to your fathers, to wit, Abraham. Deuteronomy ten fifteen, he chose their seed after them, even you, above all people, not above all houses. Amos uh, 3, 2, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. So the external church covenant and church right to the means of grace is given to a society and made with nations under the New Testament. So, again, that's Rutherford's view representing Westminster view. That was the majority view that was codified in the Westminster Confession, which you said is the heart of understanding Reformed Covenant theology. The view that you are articulating is different. It's a different understanding. It's known as the subservient covenant view. It was a position that was not held by Westminster. It was rejected by Westminster. It was uh, given an early expression by uh, 16th century 
no, I'm sorry, early 17th century theologian named John Cameron. Um, and then it was subsequently picked up and, and further developed by others. Um, in 17th century England, most of the people who followed Cameron were the Congregationalists, uh, whereas the Presbyterians, the Westminster Confession, followed Calvin's view. Uh, but those are two different, two divergent understandings of covenants of Scripture. Subservient covenant view holds a position like you hold, that the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, is not the covenant of grace, that it was not the Abrahamic Covenant. Um, they would say that it was a separate covenant, uh, it was a legal covenant, and it was separate from the covenant of grace. Um, John Bolton was a member of the Westminster Assembly, and he republished Cameron's work, uh, along with his own work, uh, True Bounds of Christian Freedom, and he said he holds to that subservient covenant view, and then he distinguished it from the majority view uh, represented in the Westminster Confession. He said, there is, however, a second opinion in which I find the majority of our holy and most learned divines concur, na namely, that though the law is called a covenant, yet it was not a covenant of works for salvation, nor was it a third covenant of works and grace, but it was the same covenant in respect of its nature and design under which we stand under the gospel even the covenant of grace, though more legally dispensed to the Jews. So the majority view, he explains, was that the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant are the same covenant. They just look different. They have different um, forms of administration. They have different ordinances. Um, their manner of worship is different, but that they're the same covenant. That's what you find in the Westminster Confession. Uh, your view is contrary to the Westminster Confession. Uh, I'd have you, I'd recommend looking at the recent OPC report on republication um, that comes to the same conclusion. Uh, I'd also recommend uh, Cornelius Venema's review of the book, The Law is Not of Faith. He has some very helpful points there. And then uh, one of the most helpful accounts I've read of kind of the history of, of these two, um, uh, two understandings in, in the early Reformation in, into the 17th century is a recent a uh, recently published dissertation called From Shadow to Substance, uh, so I'd highly recommend reading that as well. Uh, so on this point, uh, the Baptists wound up agreeing um, with both, with both the subservient and with, and with uh, Westminster or Calvin's view on different points. Um, uh, the Baptists agreed that the Mosaic Covenant was an addendum or extension or confirmation or fulfillment of the Abrahamic Covenant. And so the two of them together, um, at least part of the Abrahamic covenant, part of the Abrahamic promises are part of the old covenant. Um, but the Baptists would also say that they, uh, the Abrahamic and the Mosaic were uh, distinct from, separate from, and subservient to the covenant of grace. So they agree with um, some aspects of both views. Sorry, I had to flip around real quick. I'm in a hotel room and was losing... Losing the light out the window, so I had to turn the light here, sorry. Um, so as we've seen, the Abrahamic Covenant was made with Abraham's physical offspring. The Mosaic Covenant was a fulfillment, uh, confirmation, extension, addendum to the Abrahamic Covenant. So together, at least some of the Abrahamic promises can be considered the Old Covenant together with the Mosaic Covenant. The Abrahamic promises to give Abraham a numerous offspring, to give them the land of Canaan, was fulfilled um, to his physical offspring in the land of Canaan. Uh, I've got a long uh, a podcast series that goes into more detail on that if you want to give that a listen to hear that in more detail. However, um, Patrick, you're right, there is another sense in which the Abrahamic covenant promised more than that. Um, what, what you did in your video was you went from Genesis 15 and then kind of skipped ahead to Acts 2.39 and Romans 4.11, for example, and you kind of skipped over everything in the Old Testament there. We have to recognize that the Abrahamic Covenant, the Bible says very clearly that it was fulfilled to physical Israel in the physical land of Canaan. Um, however, we do have to also recognize that that's not the only thing that was promised in the Abrahamic Covenant. Uh, and so that's what the New Testament largely picks up on when it talks about the Abrahamic promise. It's talking about uh, a second promise that was not yet fulfilled. 
Um, so the best way to understand this is with regards to uh, understanding the dichotomous nature of the Abrahamic Covenant. Or in other words, the fact that the Abrahamic Covenant promised two things. Uh, I, like, I really like the way that Augustine put it. He said, now it is to be observed that two things are promised to Abraham. The one, that his seed should possess the land of Canaan, which is intimated when it is said, go into a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. But the other far more excellent, not about the carnal, but the spiritual seed, uh, through which he is the father not of the one Israelite nation, but of all the nations who follow the footprints of his faith, which was first promised in these words, and in thee shall all tribes of the earth be blessed. After Joshua, the people were settled in the land of promise, so that in the meantime, the first promise made to Abraham began to be fulfilled about the one nation, that is, uh, the Hebrew, and about the land of Canaan. And it was fulfilled through David and Solomon his son, whose kingdom was extended over the whole promised space, for they subdued all those nations and made them tributary. And thus, under those kings, the seed of Abraham was established in the land of promise according to the flesh, that is, in the land of Canaan, so that nothing yet remained to the complete fulfillment of that earthly promise of God, except that, so far as pertains to temporal prosperity, the Hebrew nation should remain in the same land by the succession of posterity in an unshaken state, even to the end of this mortal age, if it obeyed the laws of the Lord its God. But since God knew it would not do this, he used his temporal punishments also for training his few faithful ones in it and for giving needful warning to those who should afterwards be in all nations, in whom the other promise revealed in the New Testament was about to be fulfilled through the incarnation of Christ. What we read of historically as predicated and fulfilled in the seed of Abraham according to the flesh, we must also inquire the allegorical meaning of, as it is to be fulfilled in the seed of Abraham according to faith. So, simply put, there's more than one Abrahamic promise. Um, the promises to you and your offspring after you has a dual fulfillment. Um, it, it has a primary reference or an initial reference to Abraham's physical offspring in the land of Canaan. Um, but the second promise is, in you all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And so when that's fulfilled, um, the, or another way to put it is that the, the first promise regarding Abraham's physical offspring was given as a type of the second promise so that when Christ came, we could better understand its fulfillment. Um, because then it's, uh, the New Testament expounds upon it in terms of the type, in terms of the first Abrahamic promise. So it, it speaks of those who believe now as being sons of Abraham, whereas before the children of Abraham were his physical offspring who inherited the land of Canaan. Uh, now, with regards to the second promise, those who have faith are the children of Abraham. And um, God is a God to them. God is a God to us in a way that he was not to the Israelites, and he was a God to the Israelites in the way that he's not to us. It's two different two different meanings. One is a type of the other. So I, I would just say, Patrick, to me, um, I think the biggest trouble with the view that you put forward, and I understand it was such a short video and a couple of short sermons, um, not very in-depth, um, but the trouble that I see is that you've skipped over the type. You've skipped over the typology of the Abrahamic covenant and how it was fulfilled in the Old Covenant and the typology of Abraham's physical offspring. Um, and so all you look at is the anti-type, and, and so you miss some of the nuances there that are important in this debate. Um, you mentioned in, in that context you pull, call upon uh, Acts 2.39. You say, well, here's the promise. God said he'd be a God to you and your offspring after you. And then Peter says the promise is to you and your offspring after you. you know, therefore, the new covenant is the Abrahamic covenant. Um, I don't think it's quite that simple in light of everything we've just talked about. Um, I'd recommend reading an article from E. Calvin Beisner, uh, OPC, I think he's a ruling elder, but a uh, well-known theologian. I'm sure you're familiar with him. Um, he has a paper called um, Evangelizing Our Children, something along those lines, and he's responding largely to um, erroneous interpretations by the federal vision of, of the Genesis 17, 7 promise. Uh, with regards to Acts 2.39, he says, Are those who insist that here is a promise of the salvation of the children of believers as quick to say that there is a promise of salvation for all who are far off? Those who are not simply the children of believers, uh, those are not simply the children of believers. Those include all men everywhere in the world. But does God promise salvation to all men everywhere in the world? Certainly not. 
Neither then does he promise salvation to all the children of believers. What does he promise then to all the children of believers and to all people everywhere? Look at verse 38, and I'm going to use my own very literal transi transi uh, translation here to make clear the grammar, a grammatical cause and effect relationship that is clear in the Greek but ordinarily gets obscured in English translations. Y'all repent for the remission of y'all sins and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and y'all will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is conditional. If you repent and believe in Jesus Christ, you'll be forgiven. That promise does indeed apply to each and every child of each and every believer. And it also applies to each and every other person who ever lived or ever will live. So I think that's a much more accurate understanding of Acts 2.39. Peter is not simply saying that the Abrahamic covenant is the new covenant. He's not simply repeating Genesis 17.7. Uh, it's much more nuanced than that. Uh, with regards to circumcision, you emphasize that it is a sign of justifying faith, period. Uh, that's it. That's all it's ever been. That's what it's always been. Um, it's never been a sign of um, uh, marking identity markers for the nation of Israel or, or anything else. Um, I would disagree with you there. I believe that uh, circumcision was an oath of loyalty. Uh, committing one to full obedience to the law. Um, circumcision was not unique to Israel. It was uh, a practice, something practiced by other nations as well. In Egypt, it was a sign of, of loyalty. You were swearing your, your loyalty um, to wh whoever you were being circumcised to there. Um, and I think that's the best way to understand what's going on in Genesis 17. It is uh, an oath of loyalty to God and it commits one to full obedience to the law. Uh, Nehemiah Cox said, This covenant of circumcision was the foundation on which the church state of Israel after the flesh was built. Circumcision was the entrance into and boundary of communion in the Jewish church. It was made so by the express command of God himself, who strictly enjoined that whoever broke the covenant by the neglect of circumcision should be cut off from his people. As it was to them a gate of privilege, so it was no loss of bond of duty. Uh, it not only obliged them to obey the will of God so far as it was now made known to Abraham, but also to the observation of all those laws and ordinances that were delivered later to them by Moses. For the circumcised person was a debtor to keep the whole law. Galatians 5.3 uh, One of the texts you bring up is Romans 4.11. Um, In that text and, and in several other instances as well, uh, and I'm referring to your sermons as well as, as this video, you were very, um, I would say very eager to dismiss the Baptists and their exegesis. Um, you suggested that really it was, it was a practice or their rejection of infant baptism that was driving their misinterpretation of the text and that uh, you know, these interpre interpretations are, are ludicrous. I can't remember exactly what, what words you use there. Now, there's a subordinate document to the 1689 London Baptist Confession. It has a long section uh, in which they address Romans 4.11. So the, the theologians, just like the Westminster Standards, have some subordinate documents. Uh, the 1689 Baptist Confession also has subordinate documents to it. And they have a long excursus on Romans 4.11. And here are some of their comments. Please listen to this very carefully. Quote, <clears throat> Circumcision was given to Abraham for a seal of that righteousness which he had as yet being uncircumcised, which we will not deny to be in some sense true, but we believe that circumcision had chiefly a far different respect, end quote. Now, as a pastor, as a Christian, I want to warn you about a certain phrase that they're using here. Anytime you hear a theologian or a commentator read a text of scripture and they begin telling you what they think it means by quoting it and then saying, I wouldn't deny that in some sense this is true, but I think I have a better understanding of this. That should make red flags go up all over the place. And when I read this, I thought, ding, 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 ding. That got uh, underlined in red when I was looking at it. Romans 4.11, its description of circumcision. I want to say something here. It is not in some sense true. It is infallibly true, exactly as it is written. Now, these theologians may believe that circumcision has a far different respect that it refers to, and I'm certainly willing to listen to what they had to say, but I can assure you that I'm going to stick with what Paul says in Romans 4.11. When all is said and done, 
Now, I want to read to you, here's what they think circumcision was really all about. Listen carefully. Quote, Abraham had a twofold seed, natural of the Jews and faithful of the believing Gentiles. His natural seed was signed with the sign of circumcision. First, indeed, for the distinguishing of them from all other nations, whilst they as yet were not the seed of Abraham, but especially for the memorial of the justification of the Gentiles by faith, when at length they should become his seed. Therefore, circumcision was of right to cease when the Gentiles were brought into the faith, for as much as then it had obtained its last and chief end, and thenceforth circumcision is nothing." But in one of the points with, with regards to Romans 4.11, uh, you referenced the appendix. It wasn't a, it's not a, a subordinate standard. It's just an appendix, just a reference to the Second London Baptist Confession uh, where they deal with this text and comment on it. And you, you made a big deal about their comments there um, saying that they are rejecting the word of God. They're not holding the word of God. They're um, offering their own interpretation over it and... Uh, uh, you would recommend that we should just take God at his word instead. The interesting thing there is that you're not actually responding to what the Baptist said. You're responding to a specific quote from John Lightfoot that they quoted in the appendix. Uh, John Lightfoot was a member of the Westminster Assembly, very well respected. They were uh, quoting his commentary on 1 Corinthians 7.19. And uh, let me read it here. First um, Corinthians seven nineteen says circumcision is nothing. Um, Lightfoot says circumcision is nothing in respect of the time. For now it is vanished, the end of it for which it had been instituted being accomplished. That end the apostle shows. Uh, in those words, Romans four eleven, a seal of the righteousness of faith in uncircumcision. But I fear the words are not sufficiently fitted by most versions to the end of circumcision and the scope of the apostle, while they insert something of their own. So most translations have a seal of righteousness of faith, which he had during uncircumcision, something to that effect. Um, he says, others to the same sense, as though circumcision were given to Abraham for a sign of that righteousness which he had, while as yet he was uncircumcised, which we deny not in some sense to be true, but we believe circumcision especially looks far another way. Uh, this was the point that you ridiculed the Baptists on for saying that, well, that might be true in some sense, but we believe that um, circumcision especially looks for another way. That's Lightfoot words, not the Baptist words. So here's what Lightfoot believes the text, how the text should be translated. He says, give me leave to render the words thus. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which should hereafter be in the uncir be in uncircumcision. So one more time, Lightfoot says it should be translated, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which should hereafter be in uncircumcision. I say, which should be, not which had been, not which had been to Abraham as yet uncircumcised, but which should be to his seed uncircumcised, that is, to the Gentiles that should hereafter imitate the faith of Abraham. For mark well upon what occasion circumcision was appointed to Abraham, laying before your eyes the history of it, Genesis 17. First the promise was made to him, now thou shalt be a father of many nations. Uh, in what sense the apostle explains in that chapter. And then a double seal is subjoined to establish the thing, the changing of the name Abram into Abraham, and the institution of circumcision, verse 4. Behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Uh, why is his name called Abraham? For the sealing of his promise, thou shalt be a father of many nations. And why was this circumcision appointed to him? For sealing the same promise, thou shalt be a father of many nations. So that this may be the sense of the apostle, very agreeable to the institution of circumcision. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which hereafter the uncircumcision, or the Gentiles, was to have and obtain. Abraham had a double seed, a natural seed, that of the Jews, and a faithful seed, that of the believing Gentiles. The natural seed is signed with the sign of circumcision. First, indeed, for the distinguishing itself from all other nations, while they were not as yet the seed of Abraham, um, but especially... Uh, in memory of the justification of the Gentiles by faith, when at last they were his seed. Therefore, upon good reason, circ circumcision was to cease when the Gentiles should be brought 
into the faith because then it had attained to its last and chief end. And from thenceforth, circumcision is nothing. Um, so what Lightfoot is saying here is that the Romans 4.11 should be translated as referring to um, circumcision as a seal of the righteousness, a guarantee of the righteousness that the Gentiles would have by faith at the coming of the Messiah. It was God's guarantee of his promise. It was his seal, his confirmation of his promise that the Gentiles would be saved by the coming Messiah. Um, he, that's how Lightfoot, a member of the Westminster Assembly, a Pado baptist that's how he interprets Romans 4.11. Uh, A.W. Pink says something similar. He says, As a seal from God, circumcision was a divine pledge or guarantee that from him should issue that seed which would bring blessing to all nations, and that on the same terms as justifying righteousness had become his, by faith alone. It was not a seal of his faith, but of that righteousness which in due time was to be wrought out by the Messiah and Mediator. Circumcision was not a memorial of anything which had already been actualized, but an earnest of that which was yet future, namely of that justifying righteousness which was to be brought in by Christ. So it's God's guarantee, his seal, his confirmation of his promise that Christ would come to justify the Gentiles. Uh, moving on to 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Um, again, this is a text where you, in my opinion, rashly, rashly ridiculed the Baptists for their interpretation. You, you didn't actually accurately rep, uh, understand the interpretation known as the legitimacy interpretation of the passage. Um, I don't recall specifically, or I don't know specifically how Fred Malone um, uh, talks about it. I think that's who you reference, but uh, I think you also mentioned John Gill, and, and I think John Gill does a good job of, of explaining it adequately. Um, your response was it's completely ridiculous because it would mean that all the marriage of all unbelievers since the beginning of creation was illegitimate. Um, the other one, the other interpretation is that this is referring to um, the legitimacy of births, that God does not recognize children as being legitimate unless both uh, parents are, uh, are believers. And I remember hearing that thinking, how can anyone seriously think that that's what he's talking about here? So God, God doesn't recognize if two non-Christians are married, their children are still illegitimate in God's eyes. But that's a that's an awfully high pr price to pay to just. You see, the thing is, the passage. I don't think it, I think it, there's implications there for for the issue of baptism, but it really isn't even talking about that issue. Um, but yes, they are holy hagias. That is speaking in covenantal terms. I I, I agree completely. Now, Fred Malone, the Reformed Baptist, and John Gill, who was one of the one of the few Puritans who was a Baptistic, argue in their commentaries and in their exposition of this passage that <clears throat> this passage, what's it, what it's addressing in verse fourteen, is the legitimacy of children born to mixed marriages, marriages between believers and unbelievers. Uh, Fred Malone wrote, and I quote. To summarize, it is my conclusion that 1 Corinthians 7.14 refers either to the children's legitimacy in a legitimate marriage in the eyes of God or to their set-apart position for the sake of their parents' gospel heritage. The verse does not support a covenantal position for children. Now, folks, I want you to think about that for a minute. What Malone is arguing is that every non-Christian marriage that has ever happened since the beginning of creation produces illegitimate children. Think about that that the only legitimate children in the world have at least one believing parent, one parent that's a believer. Children are clean if they have at least one believing parent. They are part of the church. They are part of the assembly, part of the ecclesia, the people of God. And here again, why do Fred Malone, Brian Borgman, and John Gill offer interpretations which ignore that simple fact? that those terms are Old Testament terms, covenantal language, used over 200 times in Leviticus and Numbers, and hold to interpretations that render every child born on earth to unbelieving marriages illegitimate. And the answer is because they don't like the idea that children are included as part of the church under the New Covenant. 
that's just a basic misunderstanding of what's being said. That's that's not at all relevant. That's that's not what's being said. Uh, the legitimacy interpretation uh, recognizes that Paul's addressing the question of uh, the legitimacy or sinfulness of marriage between an, a believer and an unbeliever. That's the issue. It's not just legitimacy of marriage in general, but the legitimacy of a marriage between a believer and an unbeliever. That's the context of 1 Corinthians 7. It's what he's answering in various um, contexts. Um, the entire chapter is about how to view various marriage commitments as a believer. Uh, to the believer who is bound to an unbeliever, Paul says, only let each one, each person lead the life uh, that the Lord has assigned to him. Um, so brothers in whatever condition each was called, uh, there let him remain with God. But the objection that some might raise would be, well, Paul, we're not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Uh, for what partnership has righteousness with lawless, lawlessness or fellowship has light with darkness? Uh, so that could be an objection that, that Christians might have. To which Paul responds, just as you are not to participate in the worship of idols, but you may eat meat sacrificed to idols, because food is made holy by the word of God in prayer, uh, so too you are not to live as an unbeliever, but you may remain married to an unbeliever. Uh, the unbelieving marriage is made acceptable or sanctified, just like meat is made acceptable or sanctified to eat um, by the conscience of the believer who did not enter into the union in sin, but was called in that state. Um, and he says, if this were not the case, then you would have to cast off your children as well. Um, but you do not because they're sanctified, they're legitimate, they're your children. So that is what Paul's referring to there. It's the legitimacy of a marriage between um, the yoking of a marriage between a believer and an unbeliever, and that that is, in fact, legitimate. Uh, if you consider the Old Covenant background of this question, Israelites were forbidden to take wives from other nations. So in Ezra 9 and 10, um, we, as they're returning from the exile, we see the situation where Israelites had taken foreign wives and had children with them. Uh, Ezra 10 14 says that the fierce wrath of God was upon them for uh, this disobedience, and they were called to repent, and they did. Um, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children, according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the com uh, commandment of God, and let it be done according to the law. So that's uh, Ezra 10.3. Um, they had to put away their wives and also their children. They were unholy. They could not have them. They had to put them away. Their marriage to them and their um, children were illegitimate. Paul explains that the situation is very different for Christians. They do not have to put away their spouse or their children because both are sanctified or set apart for use by the Christian. Um, given the very different nature between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant in this regard, and the fact that these are two very different ways to approach the issue, uh, it would be quite mistaken to simply say that 1 Corinthians 7 14 is just a continuation of Old Covenant practice. It's not. Why? Do Fred Malone, Brian Borgman, and John Gill offer interpretations which ignore that simple fact? And the answer is because they don't like the idea that children are included as part of the church under the New Covenant. Many Pado baptists you, you can see my blog post on this for quotes from numerous Pado baptists uh, holding the same legitimacy, legitimacy interpretation, uh, including Chrysostom. He's, he's got a great one uh, explanation there, so uh, please give that a look. Um, the main problem with your interpretation of the passage, well, I think there's two. First, um, the way most Pado Baptists interpret that is to argue that holy means that the child is a member of the covenant. It's covenant holiness. But you don't believe that the children of believers are members of the covenant. So I don't know what you think that means. It's not covenantal holiness because you don't believe he's covenantally holy. You don't think he's part of um, the covenant. Um, so I don't think that's quite consistent with your own personal view. Uh, but much more than that, th the biggest problem with the Pado baptist interpretation of the passage is with the unbelieving spouse. There's no explanation for how the unbelieving spouse can be sanctified if this is referring to covenantal holiness. If the child is covenantally holy and sanctified, then the spouse is too. The problem is that the spouse is a known unbeliever. She's professing, or he or she is professing their unbelief. Um, they cannot be a member of the church. They cannot be a part of the covenant of grace, even externally, because they are a professed unbeliever. Uh, 
Um, so there's just no way to make sense of that passage uh, according to the, that standard interpretation. Uh, they would have to be cut off and not part of the covenant. Um, let's see, one other thing you mentioned is the fact that uh, I will be a God to you and to your children. Uh, the children of, of uh, are mentioned in Old Testament prophecies such as uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah. Uh, you quote several of those. Uh, and to your children it refers to the children being included in this prophecy. That just has to do with uh, prophetic idiom. In the same context, it refers to returning the Israelites to the land of Canaan. And yet you don't interpret that as, as actually going to the land of Canaan. You interpret that as, as an escat eschatological land of promise, uh, referring to the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, the same is true with, with the children there. It's, it's prophetic idiom. I would recommend, um, actually, the previous video on my channel here. It's called R. Scott Clark's Inconsistent Hermeneutic, and it directly addresses this, uh, this issue. Um, the other issue you bring up is the visible invisible church. Um, you said that you know one of the biggest problems or, or biggest things you've seen talking to Baptists is that they just don't understand the visible invisible church and they pretty much do not have a doctrine of it at all. One of the things I've noticed in a lot of Baptists that I've talked to over the years is that there really there, there seems to be almost no understanding at all of the distinction between the visible and the invisible church. It's, it's almost like that. it's just not part of, of their thinking at all. There almost seems to be, it's like there's no doctrine of the visible versus the invisible church. It's like the visible church has got to mirror the invisible church as closely as possible. I understand where you're coming from in that uh, we don't articulate it in the same way that you do. But, I mean, it's in our confession of faith. We clearly have a doctrine of it. Uh, if you look at London Baptist, Second London Baptist Confession, uh, chapter 26, the first three paragraphs, clearly lays out the distinction between the visible and invisible church. Um, so we have a doctrine of it. Um, you might just want to look at it more closely. Um, our doctrine of it is that there is one church of Christ. There are not two different churches. There's one church. Uh, the invisible church is that one church of Christ seen from God's infallible perspective, while the visible church is that same one church of Christ seen from man's fallible perspective. So the difference between the visible and invisible church is a matter of perspective. It's not a matter of two different constitutions, two different bodies, uh, two different churches. There's only one church seen from God's perspective or from man's. That's the visible invisible church distinction. Um, and again, I've got another blog post on that. Uh, lots of quotes from Pato Baptist, uh, James Usher, um, and numerous others there. Uh, I'd recommend giving that a read. Here's a quote from Ah uh, As one person cannot be divided into an invisible and a visible person, one may not divide the church into a visible and invisible church, for then it would seem as if there were two churches, each being a different church. One may also not divide the church into a visible and invisible church, as far as the members themselves are concerned, as if one had different members from the other. This is, in our opinion, an erroneous view, generating many confusing thoughts and expressions concerning the church. If one understands the differentiation between the external and internal, internal church to be but a twofold view and perspective of one and the same church, and does not hold to a twofold membership relationship, all is well, and our proposition is confirmed. The differentiation between an external and internal church on the basis of membership and relationship is not good. One and the same church, consisting of true believers only, can either be viewed in reference to their internal spiritual condition or in reference to her external manifestation in the world. Um, so again, I'm sure this raises lots of questions. I deal with them in depth in a uh, blog post I I would encourage you to read if you're interested. Um, again, you made a comment there that it would be ludicrous to try to um, only baptize those who are in the New Covenant or only baptize those who are regenerate because we can't know who those are anyways. Again, that's that's a common misunderstanding and misrepresentation of our position. We're not trying to figure out who the regenerate are and only baptize those. We're not trying to play God and see the church through his eyes. We're trying to see the church through um, our eyes and the way that God, uh, the rules that God has given us for how we are to function as a church through our fallible perspective is that we are only to baptize those who make a profession of faith. So that's what we do. There's no regeneration goggles needed. We simply require somebody to make a profession of faith. Infants don't make a profession of faith, so we don't baptize them. It's very simple. 
um, in one of your sermons, uh, I think it was your sermon, or maybe it was, I can't remember, um, you accused John Piper of really holding something close to dispensationalism um, because he distinguished between Old Covenant Israel and New Covenant Church. And you said, if you make that distinction, then you're a dispensationalist, whether you like it or not. Um, again, there's we need a lot more nuance than that. Um, Old Covenant Israel was a type of the New Covenant Church. Abraham's physical offspring was a type of Abraham's spiritual offspring. Um, the nation of Israel was a type of spiritual Israel. Um, that's not dispensational at all. In fact, it's fundamentally anti-dispensational. The dispensationalists cannot hold that view. They cannot hold that Israel was a type of the church. Um, it's fundamentally anti-dispensational. It's the view that uh, that we hold. Israel was a type of the church. It's also a view held by many Pado baptists including John Owen, Jonathan Edwards, uh, Augustine, and several others. Again, you can look on my blog for, um, for lots of those quotes. Um, so in conclusion, I, I think the main uh, problem with your view, and again, it, it appears to be a, a unique amalgamation of, of, of thought that you had, um, is that you're ignoring the typology of Abraham and his offspring and the Abrahamic covenant. Um, you're skipping over the typology completely. You're jumping from Genesis 17 to Acts 2 and ignoring everything that happens in between. We need to un understand that there were two promises made to Abraham regarding two different seeds, and one was a type of the other. Uh, and circumcision was given to his physical offspring, the type. It was a typological ordinance. Uh, it's not equivalent to baptism. Um... So I would, I would uh, press you and ask, you know, what was the Abrahamic promise specifically? Was it a promise of salvation? Uh, what was the Abrahamic promise? Who was it made to? Was it conditional? Was it unconditional? I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that. Um, I'd also love to hear your thoughts on whether or not the Abrahamic covenant was fulfilled in any way in the old covenant uh, when God established the covenant with Israel when he gave them the land of Canaan. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So in, in some, the view of 1689 federalism, I know it, it may be new to you, is that um, the new covenant is union with Christ. Uh, no one was ever saved by any other covenant. Uh, it alone is the covenant of grace. All other post-fall covenants are separate and distinct from it. They're subservient to it. They reveal the gospel. They reveal the new covenant. Um, but Abraham, Moses, all the Old Testament saints, they were actually only saved by the new covenant in the same way that they were only saved by Christ's atonement, even though the atonement had not yet occurred. Um, they were saved by the new covenant prior to its formal establishment and the death of Christ. Um, the new covenant is our union with Christ. It's the only way through which we can be saved, uh, justified, sanctified, forgiven of our sins and, and glorified. Um, so that's 69 federalism. Uh, I hope this helped. You know, maybe you and I can sit down and, and have a further discussion of this. Thanks.